Okay, we start this session. In the December of 1921, Kazi Nazrul Islam, who is remembered for his Bengali rendition of the International, had returned to Calcutta from Karachi as a demobilized soldier at the end of First World War. It was while serving as a soldier that he had heard the Russian soldiers refusing to fight the First, war, First World War and joining the revolution. In 1921, while he was making a life as a poet, writer, and publisher of radical literature, he wrote Bidrohi, The Rebel, an explosive homage to the idea of revolution in the wake of 1917. We recite a fragment taken from a translation by Kabir Chaudhary. We need shared eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I am creation, I am destruction. I am habitation, I am the graveyard. I am the end, the end of night. I am the son of Indrani, with the moon in my head and the sun on my temple. In one hand of mine is a tender flute, while in the other I hold the war bugle. I am the Bedouin, I am the Chengiz. I salute none but me. I am thunder. I am Brahma's sound in the sky and on the earth. I am the mighty roar of Israfil's bugle. I am the great trident of Pinakpani. I am the staff of the king of truth. I am the chakra and the great shankar. I am the mighty primordial shout. I am Vishamitra's pupil, Durbasha the furious. I am the fury of the wildfire. I burn to ashes this universe. I am the gay laughter of the generous heart. I am the enemy of creation, the mighty terror. I am the eclipse of the 12 suns. I herald the final destruction. Sometimes I am quiet and serene. I am in a frenzy at other times. I am the new youth at dawn. I crush under my feet the vain glory of the Almighty. I am the fury of typhoon. I am the tumultuous roar of the ocean. I am ever effluent and bright. I trippingly flow like the gaily warbling brook. I am the maiden's dark glossy hair. I am the spark of fire in her blazing eyes. I am the tender love that lies in the 16-year-old's heart. I am happy beyond measure. I am the pining soul of the lovesick. I am the bitter tears in the widow's heart. I am the piteous sighs of the unlucky. I am the pain and sorrow of all homeless sufferers. I am the anguish of the insulted heart. I am the burning pain and the madness of the jilted lover. I am the unutterable grief. I am the trembling first touch of the virgin. I am the throbbing tenderness of her first stolen kiss. I am the fleeting glance of the veiled beloved. I am her constant, surreptitious gaze. I am the gay, gripping young girl's love. I am the jingling music of her bangles. I am the eternal child, the adolescent of all times. I am the shy village maiden, frightened by her own budding youth. I am the soothing breeze of the south. I am the pensive gale of the east. I am the deep, solemn song sung by the wandering bard. I am the soft music played on his lyre. I am the harsh, unquenched, midday thirst. I am the fierce, blazing sun. I am the softly trilling desert spring. I am the cool, shadowy greenery. Maddened with an intense joy, I rush onward. I am insane, I am insane. Suddenly, I have come to know myself. All the false barriers have crumbled today. I am the rising. I am the fall. I am consciousness in the unconscious soul. I am the flag of triumph at the gate of the world. I am the glorious sign of man's victory. Clapping my hands in exultation, I rush like the hurricane, traversing the earth and the sky. The mighty Burak is the horse that I ride. It neighs impatiently, drunk with delight. I am the burning volcano in the bosom of the earth. I am the wildfire of the woods. I'm hell's mad, terrific sea of wrath. I ride on the wings of the lightning with joy and profound. I scatter misery and fear all around. I bring earthquakes on this world. Bring further earthquakes into our presence. It is our pleasure to 
introduce Jay Pater. Jay is a choreographer and uh, director of the Institute of Creative Arts in the University of Cape Town. He co-curated the recently com completed Spiel Art Festival in Munich, and he will take us through waking, sleeping, and sleeplessness, and working bodies in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everybody, colleagues and friends. I want to really thank um, Hart Kunst, uh, Akwe, Rax Media Collective, and uh, Damien uh, for getting me here. I feel very honored to be part of this, uh, of this event. And um, yeah, so without further ado, my, my topic, repetitive reenactments of fright, sleep, and wakefulness in South Africa. I w was uh, tasked with talking about the embodiment of, um, of, of struggle uh, and, you know, we could go all the way through the Bolshoi Ballet before and after, but I come from Cape Town, South Africa. I'm fourth generation uh, South African. Uh, my ancestors were brought by the British very kindly as indentured laborers to South Africa when they had colonized both, both, uh, both countries. And I, I've, I've decided to talk about South Africa and um, to talk about uh, a, a range of artists that I have curated in various festivals. So, um, yeah, and it's in 10 acts, uh, an opening, uh, a history, a failure in reconciliation, seepage, slippage, overflow, a persistent memory of the profane body, inertia, the body at risk, displacement, the migrating body, re-inhabiting spaces, disrupting form and a closing the body in stillness. And here we go. Um, and opening the contested body. So in 2006, faced with crashing of the Rainbow Nation in South Africa and the lack of economic change, I collaborated with the Suela Sonka Dance Theatre based in Durban to create a body of evidence. We set out to explore ideas of alienation and resilience and mostly memory inside of the body trying to make sense of a post-apartheid South Africa was that, that was not post-apartheid. I'm also interested in architecture and have used urban spaces for my work. This time I wanted to focus on the body as architecture. So I used the drawings of Henry Carter who illustrated Henry Gray's an anatomical guide, Gray's Anatomy. Large-scale projections of select sections of the anatomy were meant to form a kind of architecture within which we imagined the choreography would kind of take place in a kind of neat way. But as the process became more nuanced and the body's willful, oh dear, it's supposed to play, no, oops. Um, sorry, well, that is not there, so we'll go with this. So as the process became more nuanced and the body's willful and opaque, these reductive colonial drawings communicated instead an ironic, disaffected and deceptive order and symmetry. The work switched gears in a short time during the rehearsals. The history that produced these acts and the contemporary matrix that continues unabated were linked in the body, a site of contestation. With the contemporary audience we were performing to as well, it began to be less about a message than acute embodiment, and this in and of itself became a kind of triumph. There was nothing redundant or excessive possessed as the bodies were with a willful intelligence without kinetic embellishment, evasions, or approximations. Franz Fanon, of course, famously wrote, in the colonial world, the emotional sensitivity is kept on the surface of the skin like an open sore which flinches from the caustic agent, and the psyche shrinks back, obliterates itself, and finds outlet in muscular demonstrations which have caused certain very wise men to say that we are a hysterical type. This is why any study of the colonial world should take into consideration the phenomenon of dance. Of course, I see this uh, by Fanon half serious and half ironic. 
My di director's note to Body of Evidence read, the body remembers more than through the head. Let's move this further along. Nerve and vessel, artery and synapse all carry information from point to point, suffusing muscle, bone and cell with a plethora of image and sound, a flicker of light, a scream or a touch. But the body instead stores relentlessly, file upon file, bottomless cabinets of memory, individual and collective. What does a collective nation's memory do with history that we never forget, that we do forget, honor and move on, that we lie? The body is temple and fortress, porous transparency as well as taut, unrelenting opacity. It reveals as much as it conceals. But ruptures on the skin, the scar tissue and the night sweat all belie an unassailable world trapped under skin that constantly fuses shut even as it is broken. Body of evidence, therefore, flying in the face of such noble attempts to do otherwise as the truth and reconciliation hearings, instead considers the enduring and perpetual containment of an intelligence in our bones, that the body might trail behind the negotiable, agreeable, reconciling head. But when the head nods off, it catches up and chips, and then lashes out again and again and again. So now I have an aside or a digression. Elaine Scarry, uh, which, who was my starting point for Body of Evidence, had written quite poetically, when one hears about another person's physical pain, the event happening within the interior of that person's body may seem to have a remote character of some deep subterranean fact belonging to an invisible geography that, however portentous, has no reality because it has not yet manifested itself on the visible surface of the earth. Embodiment, therefore, though, as I will show later in the presentation, defies this and is indeed about connection and this interpretation between the inner and the outer. And that particularly in, in, in uh, context of othering, uh, in class struggles, there is a great need for this, this dialogue between inner and outer. But an existential disconnection is indeed very evident on three seminal inter internationally successful performances. And I'd like to just bring this as a, as a, as a point of, uh, of, of frisson with what I'm going to talk about that have come out of South Africa and importantly have traveled the world. In Athel Fugard's Busman and Lena, two First Nations people who come from the original nations of South Africa are portrayed as foragers, vultures. The European publishing house, the very famous Samuel French, described Busman and Lena as two black scavengers who emerge from the underbush loaded with their total possessions. They are the dregs of society, the stepped upon, the, sta the spat upon. They somehow become vehicles for an existential, ahistoric, angst-ridden, middle-class speculation disconnected to land or culture, agency, and most importantly to their bodies, often staged as ahistorical figures. In writing the Lena character, Fugard recorded in, records in his notebook, fishing on the sandbanks of the Swatkops River in South Africa, I saw her, Lena, either drunk or a hangover, duke on her head, barefoot sense of appalling physical and spiritual destitution of civility without the slightest flicker of self. And Busman, one of the characters, says, we are not people anymore, freedom's not for us, we stood there under the sky, two crooked hottentots. So they laughed, sis, Verald, all there is to say, that's our world, after that, our life is dumb. William Kentridge's uh, and Handspring Puppet Company directly transformed George Buchner's existential melodrama, the very evocative Wojciech, into uh, the South African gold mining territory, calling it also a very evocative production, Wojciech on the, on the high field. Oh, I've got a clip. It's extremely beautifully wrought, but the character is un, uh, uh, finally and ultimately a puppet. It's extremely powerful as a metaphor, but whose face is not malleable, incapable of movement, shift or change, and all of this would be very fine. But when you combine it with Buchner's self-reflexive text together with the character's immobile face, it seems to solidif solidify a fate.
Brett Bailey takes it even a step further. And in Exhibit B, which I think uh, came to Germany a few, a few years ago, the recipients of colonialism and apartheid are rendered not just immobile, but also silent. There is no voice, no movement, just a passive staring back. In contrast, choreographer, choreographer contemporary choreographer Spanogaliso Ndabo, who's working in South Africa right now, created a work recently called Impumulelo. Uh, she works with a group of unemployed young people from the townships of Kailicha, Guguletu, and Langa. In South Africa, the poverty line is 45 euro per month, and 55%, 12 million people, live below this. This is 22 years after democracy. Drawing from people that come from this context, she created a work, she created this work, and um, I just thought it would be really interesting to see the, just the difference in this embodiment of bodies that graphically show self-determination and kinetic intelligence beyond the potentially debilitating heinous society. Let's hope this works. There we go. And go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> It was part of, um, of a series of community dance groups, and it's just an a point of contrast. That was my digression, sorry. Um, act two, the uh, history, will, and intelligence embodied. And um, uh, this is just a history to contextualize some of this embodiment hi um, historically. Um, so uh, I think you've all experienced in some form the gumbo dance. To understand, though, the gumbo dance is to understand the establishment of mines and the influx of the West into South Africa to pillage the gold mines and other mines. Sorry. With such levels of greed as to exercise not only this extraction, but to extract at the same time the cheapest labor, and to do this, one had to impose perhaps the most stringent forms of behavior to keep this intact. So there were the humiliating searches. The living conditions in single sex hostels and the past checks. And ultimately, a regime of silence imposed on the miners forbidden from talking with each other. Out of this need for communication arose the scumbo dance, a slapping of codes into the boot that was polyrhythmic, derivative of classical African dance, but shifted. Uh, and I've got a video. And of course, most importantly, codes used to communicate because 
of a regime of silence that was imposed on the mine workers. There were other forms that did this as well, and um, Iskatamir, the dance of the cat, was uh, is a very good example. I'm going to just play a video while I speak. So this form was developed in the basements of the mine worker compounds, and there is a there is a the the idea of the, um, the work which you probably seen through Lady Smith Black Mombasa, who had made it very popular. The, the use of suits and the working in the small spaces had taken these vast, expansive, traditional and classical uh, African dancers and made them into what they were. And this, this series of, of adjustments and then the use of the suits and the use of the syncopated rhythm has created an enduring sound for South Africa and, and continues, as I will talk about later in the presentation. A link with tradition, but dehumanizing a, a, de, a de, but humanizing a dehumanizing job, going beyond the ravages of capitalism. And I am um, going to talk about several other forms. Uh, there's a there's another form, uh, the um, Nazareth Baptist Shembe Church, and uh, this is a this is a. A religion that combines Christianity, which was imposed with traditional ritualistic worship, and the um, the, the 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 religion has uh, was only able to get purchase as a result of building these temples because they weren't allowed inside the churches the, to build these temples, and you see them all throughout KwaZulu Natal and northern uh, Gauteng, these um, these circles of of white stones. But it's also in the dress itself, uh, incorporating quite hilariously sometimes this, um, the kilts and the pith helmets. Which became, which became a, a, a particular vindication of what, what, they, were, were, what, uh, what they were after. Um, I'm going to talk quickly now through Act 3, A Failure in Reconciliation and the Abandoned Body. So in 1994, as um, apartheid ended and the dawn of the new era was ushered in by Nelson Mandela, South Africa gave the world a gift in the form of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, purportedly a container of trauma. The vision of the TRC was tempting in its neatness, its clean arc that narrativized the, the trauma in a linear cause, effect and resolution configuration. Uh, the, t uh, the TRC was an attempt to address apartheid, which was immersive, multimodal, and pervasive, not what singular dictators did, but what ordinary people did to other ordinary people. The TRC nevertheless posited a straightforward confessional exposition, dramatic builds, climactic admissions, quick character turnarounds, and grand gestures of compassion and neat end endings. And as we know throughout the world, none, nothing good comes out of that kind of linear arc. Uh, most of all, though, the TRC glossed over the fact that South Africa's wealth and land remained pretty much where it was under apartheid. Re reparations were, were not spoken of, or barely. This remembering of a violent past, then, has clear reference to an immediate present. Post-Mandela, South Africa abandons its social welfare project, the Reconstitution, uh, Reconstitution and Development Program, the RDP, and embraces GEAR, the Go Growth, Employment and Redistribution Program, and the neoliberal economy as well, in an effort to be part of world markets. Of course, this has been challenged as not a sudden break, but it was embedded in the apartheid government as it was handing over power, the preservation of economic power inside of uh, a, a globalized scenario. 
In the recent years, though, the incident at Marikana, which some of you must have heard of, when four, 34 miners were killed simply for striking, the body reenacts fright and wakefulness in the pursuit of will and intelligence and becomes an enduring symbol for what has gone tragically wrong in South Africa. Anthony Bogues of Brown University talks about the role of repetitive enactments of memory, characterizing the black body as repeatedly as the disposable but required body, a thingification that he derives from Césaire. He invokes the neoliberal economy, recalling the black body as a source of fright and therefore one in need of tutelage to be disciplined and subjected. His contention is that the objectifying and silencing that happened in the brazen openness demonstrated in the killing of 34 black, black miners who went strike in Marikana was precisely about putting an end to fright and a desire to end the source of that fright. Imgukeni Noki and this one of the speakers on the side of the mountain and amongst those who was killed becomes over, the, over, over these years, an enduring tragic embodiment of will and intelligence so concentrated it is repeated in various forms. And that was with the disappearance of the Sizzle John Road statue. Yet another twist in this quintessential post-apartheid tragedy is the involvement of Cyril Ramaphosa, our current deputy president, who was himself the founder of the National Union of Mine Workers in 1982. At the Marikana hearing, we hear of emails he sent the day before the shootings. Let's see. Oh. It's a government sabotage. I'm quoting now. Does that the criminal acts and must be characterized as such? In line with this characterization, there needs to be concomitant action to address the situation. I'm interrupting you, but what is the date of that email that you read? It is the 15th of August, 2.58, exactly 24 hours before the people were mowed down in that, at that mountain. It's addressed to uh, somebody called Dear Albert, who's Albert Jamison of, of Lonmen, I assume. So when the Kantian project, so Act 4, seepage, slippage, overflow, when the Kantian project of reason that characterizes a great deal of South African working class society, we, we had to absorb this from government in order to to deliver itself to the world in the past 22 years, when it starts to crack, seepages in the form of truth must out. A spillage, if you want, in the realm of the sublime or sublime's extreme, the chaotic, the overflow. Now, the performances by uh, various political parties in Parliament um, are, are a more formal evocation of this. But in all of this real-life challenge to the clean, linear narrative, this challenge to neat endings and denouements, the body, its excesses, overflows, becomes more and more prevalent and visible. The launch of the Rhodes Must Fall movement with the throwing of excrement, of course, uh, is a searing example. Tumani Matwela, dressed in tights, enacts a carefully constructed performance that cut to the heart of the continued centrality of colonial symbology and the systemic violence in South African institutions. The symbol of excrement or people's shame associated with the poor state of sanitation in South Africa's townships is of course picked up by many writers of in post-colonial African literature. But current extremities I see as something about material realities that, that, are, that will out the volatile energy of this discourse, of this revealing, this illumination, unpredictable, formless, but seems to be a search of res in search for a response that matches the weight and pressure and gravity of the silence and neat linearity of constructs, such as the TRC. This is the devolution of the Cecil John Rhodes statue.
during that time, there was something called the White Shield, where um, black protesters, in a, uh, where during that that protest, uh, some white protesters students joined, and they were put in front of the of the of of, of the of the various groupings, and then they put their arms in the air and they began to be known as the White Shield because knowing that the policemen won't attack because of this this layer of white bodies. It's a poetic and yet tragic example, um, a symbol of the value of black bodies. And so stones became embodied in various forms. Th uh, this 13-year-old um, was uh, protesting because uh, her school, and this was a rampant thing throughout schools, demanded that she cut her hair. And this is now 22 years after democracy. What follows, though, are a series of works by artists who, artists who embody this movement in the Live Art Festival in Cape Town in 5 a persistent memory the profane body i want to talk quickly through this um the, uh, at the goodman gallery there was um, uh, an artwork by Brett murray um and it uh, it was called the spear um and it was in this very commercial uh, high end gallery uh, the painting of course um is inserted um uh, jacob zuma's faces on it's a very bad painting on the classic even of poster lenin lived lenin is alive lenin will live um and of course um jacob zuma's genitals are exposed 
Now he uh, he took the the the, the gallery to court, etc. And there was a there was a great um, fracas, and uh, 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 a number of people. Um, um, hundreds of people marched towards the gallery and so it began to be around censorship and um and and what people saw as a as a as a th as a some attack on 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 the black body and in the middle of it all this is what happened More volume, more volume. And then all hell broke loose in the country. The height of it was when the president's lawyer, um, Athena Malindi, wept uh, in court, uh, trying to find the link between race, poverty, apartheid, and censorship. Subsequently, um, the singer and composer, Simpima Dana, wrote, uh, wrote in a letter. Uh, I'm just going to quickly uh, read it, even though you can. Uh, Jacob Zuma is the worst president, and he has set us back the feminist movement, but we can't sacrifice one struggle for another. The image of a black man with his penis hanging out in, on display in galleries, plastered all over the internet, in your newspaper, for our children to see, for the whole world to see, shifted something in me. And this is really important. An animalistic howl died in my throat, perhaps a gene memory flashback, coupled with the reality of my existence today. It felt like giving birth to death, like this new South Africa is stillborn. Ashil Mbemba provides another view. The controversy surrounding the exhibition of President Jacob Zuma's private parts has not only unleashed a torrent of emotions and passions, it has also revealed high levels of negative and at times toxic energy. What Brett Murray has done is like sticking a needle in the heart of a figure. And I'm just going to move to the last paragraph. What has irked many is that after 20 years of freedom, the black body is still a profane body. It still does not enjoy the immunity accorded to properly human bodies. So the desecration then of a, of a naked black man who is the president by a white artist inside of a white-owned gallery becomes a performative gesture, a quintessential South African eruption when the surface of reconciliation, the sheen of normality, has to give way to a range of questions around art, ownership, the body, culture, and race. These questions appear with a violent intensity when a seemingly harmless middle-class gallery um, uh, gets marched to and, th and being threatened to burn down. The, the vulnerable body, sorry about that, the vulnerable body, race and gendered, is a repetitive enactment in contemporary protests, and these are images just from uh, last week at the University of Cape Town. And these are images from ICLEA, the, uh, the women's collective, who uh, repeatedly create these movement moments of, um, of stillness and, um, and anarchy. This is commute to uh, uh, referencing the same issues. All right, um, uh, inertia. I'm going to run. I think I'm running out of time. Uh, so t on your left is the, on the small screen is an excerpt from a documentary called Train Spotting. Um, to your right is uh, on the large screen is a video of a performance artist I curated, Celo Pes and Von Sedi, in a work called Inhabitant. Um, but this, of course, is a performance in Istanbul. Uh, let's hope that everything works. So 
So while memory and a traumatic past bleeds into the present, the present that reenacts the deprivations of the past and allows memory its visceral graphic reimagining, a grip on the future is much more tenuous. South Africans live in a slippery, oily state of promise of the real fruit of democracies that has been so hard won. The future resembles a suspended malaise, futures made sweet through political promise and a rapidly waning patience with national projects of social cohesion. The good life repeatedly inscribed as something in the future by government makes reality a kind of unreality, a distinction, a floating above the ground. The constant rupturing of a narrative of material progress articulated at the onset of democracy in 1994, the narrative of development of cause and effect reinforces a state of stasis, impotence and inertia. I mean, train spotting is not unique to South Africa, but um, it uh, happens with such in various kinds of ways, in, in various forms. And I've asked permission from the filmmaker to, because there was a lot of controversy when the video came out. Big screen. This is the the opening of the festival, and of course the the mayor was speaking, and the performance had already started. So, um, choreographer Boise Klekwana, um, his work is often characterized by this, this repetitive kind of absurdity, and yet uh, for a reach of the non sequitur, but still highly expressive. In his um, in, ca in Case of Fire, Run for the Elevator, he tells a story, sorry, he tells a story of food and its intricate, uneven, and invisible poetics. He dissects authority. Uh, is the sound okay? There we go. He directs uh, he dissects authority while presenting in his words a silent musical of rhythmic interventions to a score heard only by the interlocutors. A tawdry essay on the disquiet of an angry stomach grumbling at the deafening din of culinary correctness. In case of fire, is an attempt to run for the elevator in the midst of an inferno concocted by the misadventures of a rather misguided crew attempting to escape the, con the confines of serious art. The work honors imbecility and pokes fun at heroism, authority, and the republic. It flirts with ambitions of leg legitimacy as it scours the unknown terrain of artistic acceptability. I'm quoting from Boise. Act 7, uh, Displacement and the Migrating Body. So in all of this displacement, migration is a pause, right? It's an embodiment of a pause and a regroup. On your right is a video based on a poem I wrote by Opio Okach. And your left, Arrested Motion by Meghna Singh. And this is my poem. Move, block, avoid, wait, turn, move, block, pause, turn around, move, block, wait, annihilate, replan, move, block, stay, move, block, retreat, move, block, settle, temporarily, move, circumnavigate, pass, move, 
hold, accept, help, move, blocked, reduce, obliterate, become small, adapt, dysfunction, move, block, smile, stop, smile again, show teeth, stop smiling, block smile, again, lift hand, lift other hand fast, wave, move, block, drop hands, move, step on the side, wait, avoid the four by four, step back, move, block, look down, look up, smile, move, look away, block, hand in pocket, hand out of pocket, quick, turn, block, look away, block, push, step back, step back, push, block, push, block, push, step, block, block, push, snatch, run, block, push, run, drop cover, face, spit, move, block, wait, move, smile, laugh, laugh loud, laugh, L laugh, hand to mouth to stop, move, block, wait, look at the sky, sing loudly with mother's tongue, straighten back, move, 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 block, avoid, rest, move, block, wait, move, block, think, think, to destroy, evaporate, invisible, hover, float, fall, reappear, move, block, wait. Act 8, re spaces, the infectious body. Cape Town, Cape Town ranked the international winner of TripAdvisor's Travel Choice Awards, the New York Times and The Guardian's top travel destination. We get a lot of visitors from Germany. It's also a city where apartheid was born, and these remnants of apartheid show up with enduring presence in a topography 22 years after apartheid. So all the pink uh, areas are the white areas, the mustard areas are colored areas, and the blue areas are black African areas. So majority of the city's black population reside in these far-flung townships known collectively as the Cape Flats. They were holding grounds for migrant workers brought in from rural areas to work in the city during apartheid. And just to give you an idea um, how these, 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 um, these settlements live side by side, Now, wh whatever this is, artist and academic Kanyasi Limbongwa has developed notions of the township alleyway, the pathways among shacks and informal houses called Iranga, as public space, invoking Elipin, who argued that as well as being a port into major cities, the township developed as a peripheral space that was never allowed to be fully modern nor fully rural, and is thus both a hybrid and a liminal space in relation to modernity. She constructs Iranga as a liminal space within a liminal space. And this is really, really I interesting and very powerful, especially in the theme that we are talking about. A threshold within a threshold, spaces within what Franz Fanon calls a world without spaciousness. She writes, in many cases, township space is represented as temporary and uninhabitable, but how's the existence of Iranga enable much more complex dialogues about the paradoxes of black lived experience. And this is about to keep, to remake or to annihilate completely, right? If townships are an apartheid project, where are the spaces of resilience that people have carved within them as these spaces continue to seem permanent in post-apartheid South Africa as spaces of habitation? She argues that Iranga is precisely such a space enabling black radical imagination. And I mean, on some level, even though um, the, 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 the development of Pansula uh, is, a, is a very good case in point. Now, this might seem like an ordinary street dance, but acknowledging the importance of feet in such places with little access for anything else but the human body Bongwa writes, the feet, an important means, uh, means of mobility, enables one to walk, to run, to run to the train. These, um, these areas are, of course, completely inaccessible with cars, and the feet become really, really important. So, Upansula, footwork, is a silent revolution of those who dared themselves beyond the geographic uh, location that rendered them static and docile.
Mbongkwe evokes a Shilimbembe who argued that dreams deal with reanimation, allowing the person existing from the border zone to re-enter the space of full humanity. Um, Ashil Mbemba, of course, sees dreams as sets of practices and modes of critique which allow life to erupt and in erupting to escape the state of matter in which structures of power, exploitation and subject, subjugation seek to confine it. As a, power, a possible disruptor of this topography as instigator, interfering with the flow, stopping this anesthetic state, this numbness, this docile acceptance, art is the one or the other. It submerges, fits in, beautifies, exemplifies, embodies, or it disrupts this flow and uh, creates its own and I'm arguing that there's this kind of constant tension in that uh, and let's see my final oh, shit. okay so infecting the city uh, was something uh, is a public art festival that started and we worked I'll just let you watch the video So um, the 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 uh, sorry that wasn't the I'm just going to run through this very quickly. Um, uh, the, uh, the you know the, the the notion of infecting the city is ta being taken very seriously by artists, of course. The idea of um, bringing and th this was an, a, a work by Memory Biwa and um, Nicole Samiento, where the 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 Cape Town is based also on burial sites, right? And so they created this these rituals on various burial sites, and, and I mean the number of sites of bones that are contained inside the the earth of Cape Town is quite extraordinary. And as part of the festival, they created this. Tiboko Munyai created these shacks, which was w it's quite it was very powerful because um, the works were inside and you could only see them through through these bullet holes and you it became a very um, it became an, uh, a, a task of of um, of watching other people watch um, Ati Pataruga inside a swimming pool in the middle of the city. Yeah, I'm going to run through these and um, hate myself for having so many slides, but here we go. Um, so the, 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 um, the idea also of um, young people from, from the various townships coming into the city in, in some manner of means, um, uh, queer bodies becoming extremely visible, um, issues of migration, but very much issues of touch as well and um finding finding this this intimacy inside of um of what can be an extremely alienating city and creating this this uh, a sensorium and of course owning these spaces and it's a it's an exercise in futility of course because it's so bloody temporary but anyway we still do it uh and we have to clean up afterwards so yeah um so quickly then, uh, disrupting form, the body reassembles. And I, I mean, I'm just, I'm going to just show you a second of this um, before I get carried away. Um, the, the, the Live Art Festival in 20s, um, last this year, uh, at the beginning of this year, I think showed um, this reach towards, in, in many of the works, um, there's a whole range of performance artists here, but showed this reach towards finding 
much more explicit and clear articulation in this embodiment of these nuances. This was in one of your shopping malls last week or two weeks ago. as well as Gabriel Goliath. This is uh, Jalili Atiku from um, from Lagos. Around um, the oil spillages on the coastline of uh, of Lagos. This is Gadat, which was also here in Munich. All right, I'm going to have to close. So, uh, <laughs> closing the body in stillness, and um, I have nothing left to say. So, um, I just offer you two uh, magnificent artists, Gabrielle Goliath, uh, who I curated for the Salzmacher, and she does this work called Stumbling Block, and uh, Stembile and Susanne. Uh, uh, so on your right, you will see uh, a series of performances by Ms. Zane, who in a very stillness challenges in her endurance performances the overwhelming presence of, of sculptures of white men in Cape Town, challenging concrete and mortar with embodied thinking, knowing flesh. So this is Gabrielle Goliath. <coughs> and that's her... Thank you very much. Thank you.